Okay, let's get to chapter 16. And let me suggest to you that the measure of a man's walk is found in his obedience to God, not in his apparent victories. You can look like life is really going well and you are absolutely victorious and not be. You can't go by the surface appearance. Our life is measured at the end of the day by our obedience to God, not by the accolades other people put on us. I want to show you seven flaws in chapter, uh, chapter 15 that come up that uh, sort of outline, I'm actually toward the end of 14 and into 15, but I want, to, uh, I want to look at seven flaws that come up in the narrative that help us understand they should have been the undoing of Samson, but they weren't because God used them. Do not mistake the fact that God uses you for you doing it right, okay? Uh, I've, I've told you before that my, my Bible teacher um, in, back in high school, John Mc, uh, 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 Steve McFarland, was, was uh, led to Christ by a drunk priest who read from John 3. The fact that he read from John 3 and the guy got saved does not validate that as a method of doing it, okay? So just because it works, it doesn't mean that's the right way to do it. Don't look at it like your victory is somehow related to your goodness, the, the rating of whether or not you are doing right is whether or not you are do, obe, obeying God and doing right. That's, that's the way to do it. Okay, take a look at 4, 19, uh, 1419 for a minute. One of those times when I'm just stumbling on words. 1419. All right. These are the flaws that are in Samson's life that could have ended everything early. Flaw number one in 1419, poor communication. He, his anger burned and he went up to his father's house. He walked out. In other words, instead of communicating and fixing his problems, he slammed around and walked out the door. That's one of the flaws that were, were, was very much a part of his character that could have been his undoing, but the Lord used it. And in 15.1, it says, After a while, in the time of the wheat harvest, Samson visited his wife with a young goat and said, I will go into my wife in her room. But her father did not let him enter. In other words, he shows up after a long period of time and says, well, woman, this is my wife. I'm bringing you a goat. And that's not what he was there for. What's the issue? No, uh, no discipline. No discipline. When his appetites moved him, he acted. It wasn't about discipline. It wasn't about decision making. He decided he would go back and take advantage of his lawful relationship with his wife. And his father said no. Does everybody understand why the father said no? You have left her with me and I've paid her bills and I've taken care of her. And you walked out on her and now you're coming back and you think you're sleeping with her? I don't think so, big guy. Now, verse, uh, uh, the end of verse 1 all the way through verse 6, tells a story of his third flaw, which was incredible, utter selfishness. Listen to the story. He almost sounds infantile, okay? Listen to the story. It says, her father said, I really thought that you hated her intensely, so I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister more beautiful than she? Please let her be yours instead. Samson then said to him, This time I shall be blameless in regard to the Philistines when I do them harm. Samson went and caught 300 foxes and took torches and, and turned the foxes tail to tail and put one torch in the middle between the two tails. And when he had set fire to the torches, he released the foxes into the standing grain of the Philistines, thus burning up both the, sho uh, the shocks and the standing grain along with the vineyards and the groves. When the Philistines said, who did this? They said, Samson, the son-in-law son of the Timnite, because he took his wife and gave her, her to his companion. So the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. What he does is he creates a situation where they are killed by their own people. He says, this time I'm not, I'm going to lift a finger against you. I'm going to make you wish you were dead. I'm going to turn your own people against you. It, uh, in the 80s and early 90s in Israel, the Smokey the Bear in all of the forest was actually a, a fox with a, a torch on his tail. And this came from this story. That used to be the, uh, in all of our, when I was first in Israel as a young person, um, that was the sign that you saw everywhere, the fox with the torch on his tail. And it came from the Samson story. The important thing is, 
Look at how incredible. He feels justified in attacking people's food because it hurt his feelings. How incredibly selfish is this guy? Not only is he incredibly selfish, look at the wrong standards he has in verses 7 and 8. He has absolutely wrong standards. When Samson saw the harsh and merciless behavior of the Philistines toward their own villagers, he became hardened. He believed the villagers had wounded him had taken his chosen wife and killed her, and that wounded him. He, did you ever know somebody that everything in the world was all about them? Yes, I know the president did this, but that's just because he really wanted me to... No, he doesn't know you, okay? Samson is so incredibly self-affixed that he has the wrong standards of how he judges things. So he says in verse 7, Samson said to them, Since you act like this, I will surely take revenge on you. But after that, I will quit. He struck them ruthlessly with a great slaughter. He went down and lived in the cleft of the rock at Atom. Here's what he does. He goes in. He sees that they killed his father-in-law and his wife. And he goes in and kills a whole bunch of them. They killed his father-in-law and his wife because he wiped out their fields. But he keeps looking at it like stuff is happening to him when he's the one initiating the problem. Now, in a way, he is now for the first time free of a covenant relationship with this woman and back on track with his life, maybe? No, not really. His fifth flaw was overconfidence. And in verses 12 and 13, He's utterly overconfident. Look at verse 9. It says, The Philistines went up, camped in Judah, and spread out at, Le at Lehi. The men of Judah said... Why have you come up against us? And they said, we have come to bind Samson in order to do to him as he has done to us. Then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock at Etam and said to, to Samson, do you not know that the Philistines are rulers over us? What then is this that you have done to us? And he said to them, as they did to me, so I have done to them. They harmed my wife, my father-in-law, so I did this to them. I feel perfectly justified. But look at how under, unbelievably confident he is. Then, then he said, we have come to bind you so, uh, so that we may give you into the hands of the Philistines. Samson said to them, swear to me that you will not kill me. So they said to him, no, but we will bind you fast and give you into their hands. Yet surely we will not kill you. Then they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. Now they're bringing him and he's letting them do it. You know why? He is so incredibly confident. He said, I can take them with my hands tied behind my back if I have to. Not only is he overconfident, but there's another flaw. The sixth one is he has a misconception about God's uses. God used the situation to chastise the Philistines and keep their power in check. Even though Samson, as a vessel, left a lot to be desired, God used him to perform a function just as he did the Babylonians to come and chastise his own people later on. And the point is, the fact that God empowers and uses a person does not validate their methodology or their walk with him. You are going to find that some people have an incredibly powerful ministry that aren't walking with God. God does what God does. And he is not limited to only the people who want him or do it well. So don't get the idea that because lots of people go there, it must be the right thing. Don't get that idea because there's lots of people that go to places they shouldn't go. The point is this. He has a misconception about God's uses, and you see it in verse 14. He came to Lehi, the Philistines shouted out as they met him, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily. Okay, every time you see that phrase, what's going to happen right after? Somebody's dying. Okay, so the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, and so that the ropes that were on his arms were as flax that is burned with a fire. This is a great illustration. They were just, they were like, they were rotted like nothing. He could just go poof. And his bonds dropped from his hands. He found a fresh jawbone of a donkey. So he, he reached out and he took it and killed a thousand men with it. When Samson, then Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I've killed a thousand men. He starts into a musical here. He's just wiped out a thousand guys with the jawbone of a donkey and now he's going to sing and dance? 
When he had finished speaking, he threw the jawbone from his hand and he named the place Ramat Lahi. And interestingly enough, he goes on and says, then he came very, became very, very thirsty. Well, you know, when you kill a thousand guys with a bone of a donkey, you get thirsty. Is this not the beginning of a Gatorade commercial here? You know, when I've been out killing a thousand men with a donkey bone, I get thirsty. I mean, I, I almost have to laugh at this because it's really like, and he got very thirsty. Well, yeah, okay, you've been out there like killing people. And, and here's the thing. Right is defined as doing what God's word teaches, not what seems to bring the results of strength and victory. Guys, let me stop here and say, I'm going to give you the seventh one, but let me stop here and say something. One of the problems in today's church is we think if it works, it must be right. That's pragmatism and it's wrong. There's a, I can make something seem like it works, but it's not the right thing if it's not what God said to do. So for instance, all you have to do to get a really big church is just go out and hire the most awesome singers to do the most awesome, quote, worship. But they're not doing worship unless they walk with God. Then they're just doing singing that looks like worship. You can, you can set it all up and bring in the lights real low and have the smoke come in and, and have an awesome concert week after week. Or let's do it another way. Let's bring in, let's go to... Um, uh, uh, bluegrass and bring in the best bluegrass people in the world. I can't even imagine that there are such things, but let's, uh, you know, or let's, you know, let's go get to this big, you know, kind of show and people are going to come to it. Now, big is not bad and small is not holy, but do not make the mistake of believing because lots of people, because it appeals to so many people that it's the right thing. Frankly, if that were the case, we would all just eat chocolate. But that's not what's right. It's, it may be what we like, because all civilized people love chocolate, especially dark. But, okay, now stop here. Here's the seventh flaw. The seventh one, go down to verses 18 to 20, is an undue sense of privilege. Uh, one single word for that, by the way, is entitlement. Listen to me very carefully when I say this. The opposite of the spirit of God is the spirit of entitlement. Yes, ma'am. Number four. Uh, number four was wrong standards. Number five was overconfidence. Number six, misconception about God's uses. And number seven, undue sense of privilege or entitlement. Samson questioned God because Samson found himself in an uncomfortable position. Let's go to verse, at verses 18 to 20. Then he became very thirsty. He called to the Lord and said, You have given this great deliverance by the hand of your servant, and now shall I die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? Are you kidding me? Do you realize that in the, in the prayer life of Samson, the only prayer we have is him telling God how God is, is wrong? So don't get the idea that just because God uses him mightily, it's because he's such a good guy. He's really not. So... Why is he one of the judges? Why is he in the list of judges if he's such a bonehead? Because God used him. Judges is about the results of God's deliverance, not about the goodness of the people who did it. Don't get the idea that just because he's a hero in the Bible, he's even a good person. I wouldn't even want to be this guy's friend. Okay. Yes, in wartime, I wouldn't mind having him on my side. Okay, I'll admit that. But he's not a nice person. Does anybody know people like this? It's all about them. They're totally self-absorbed. They walk around with this entitlement and privilege thing. Verse 19, God split the hollow place that is in Lahi so that the water came out. And when he drank, his strength returned and he revived. Therefore, the, he named the place En Hakore. And which, you know, Ain is actually the word for a spring, okay? Uh, the, the spring of the place that split. And uh, he judged Israel 20 years in the days of the Philistines. When it says he judged Israel, did he like sit there and like give them, yes, you should marry them, no, you shouldn't go to college? Is that what he's talking about? 
it sounds like that. The Sunday school reading is that he judged Israel. So, so in the flannel graph, you have him sort of sitting there like a judge because he did this for 20. All this means is God used him on, on periodic occasions to humble the Philistines over a 20 year period. It doesn't mean he did right. It doesn't mean he thought right. It doesn't mean he was a good guy. He was none of those things. Now, when you get to chapter 16, where we end, I want, to see, I want you to see some life principles of some very arrogant people. There are dangerous life principles in his life. And the, pro, the principle behind this is you've got to break up the hard heart or you're going to leave the crop of pain that's harvested in the life of other people. You don't break up the hard heart that you have and it's going to cause pain in other people's lives. That's what you're going to grow. And what I know is that this guy is unbelievably arrogant. Samson loses control again, and it's 20 years later. In 16-1, 20 years has passed since the end of 15. He's now 20 years older, and he's no smarter. Okay? I want you to notice that in, ver in, verse, in the verse 1, he takes an unwise journey. Samson goes to a place where he doesn't belong. Where is he at? Gaza. Gaza is one of the five cities of the Philistines. Gaza, Gath, Ekron, Ashdod, Ashkelon, or the Philistine Pentathlon. So he goes to the Philistine area and saw a harlot there and went into her. Is anybody with me having problems with his decision-making process? Okay, now he's in the wrong town at the wrong place doing the wrong thing. This ought to work out well. So he was unwise in his journey. He was unwise in his gazing again, and then he gets involved in an ungodly practice. And then in verse 2, it says, When it was told to the Gazaites, saying, Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city, and they kept silent all night, saying, Let us wait until morning light, and we will kill him. So what he has is an uncontrolled reputation. Everybody hears he's in town. Everybody knows this guy's rash. He's dangerous. Everybody knows he's taken an unnecessary risk coming right into their town. And then there's an unwarranted overreaction. Now Samson lay until midnight. And at midnight he arose and took hold of the doors of the city gate and the two posts and pulled them up along with the bars. Then he put them on his shoulders and carried them up to the top of the mountain, which is opposite Hebron. That's a long distance. He decided to pick up the city gate and take it away. And he took it so long that it would take a whole team of, of horses to bring it back. So he just ripped it out of the ground and carried it away. Now, what's interesting is that's an unbelievable overreaction and it's a humiliation. You have to understand Middle Easterners. You humiliate them and they will wait a generation to come back and catch you. So, so all he did was, he, it was, like, was like sticking his hand into a wasp's nest, which I did the other day accidentally, by the way. And so what happens as a result? of Look at the principles in the life of this arrogant man. First, we find him using wrong assumptions that lead to wrong connections in verses 4, 5, and 6. After this, it came about that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. I could end the story here because you all know it doesn't go well. The, the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said, entice him and see where his great strength lies, how we may overpower him and he may bind, we may bind him to afflict him. Then we will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your strength is and how you may be bound to afflict you. And Samson said to her, if they bind me with fresh cords that have not been dried, then I will become weak and be like another man. He's making it up. But again, he's playing with something. By the way, she's the third woman in the story. She's had the, has his um, wife, then he's had the prostitute. Now we're at Delilah. And none of them have worked out well for him. Why? Why, does he, why are all the women in the story so bad? They all yeah, because he went to the wrong place to meet them. When I, when I look at this, here's what I see. I see wrong assumptions that lead to wrong conclusions because Samson assumed that he could always come out on top, so he played around again with the holy things. 
He kept thinking, you know, he doesn't have, the rules don't matter. Can I just offer this one piece of advice? Companions need to be screened. You need to be careful about who you hang out with. He's hanging out with somebody, and here's the remarkable thing. This is the part of this story that, honestly, I get the rest of the story. This part I don't get. After the Philistines come down on you the first time, why do you think Delilah is still somebody you should be hanging out with? The first time you set me up to die, I'm done with you. Can I just say that publicly? Ashley, if you set me up to die, I'm done with you, okay? We're not, we're not playing games with, like, my life. He is so overconfidently arrogant that he actually believes that no matter what he does, he's going to come out on top. That's dumb. That's how people get killed. Now, wrong connections can lead to wrong conclusions. And he makes a wrong conclusion here in verses 7 to 10. And what I think is funny is, is it, verse 8 says, the lords of the Philistines brought her up seven fresh cords that had been dried up, and she bound him with them. Now she had men lying in wait in an inner room, and she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he snapped the cords as a string of toe snaps when it touched the fire, and his strength was not discovered. Now look at the way Delilah plays it. How many of you would be like, yeah, I'm really embarrassed that we played this game. Not Delilah, she's going to play it again with him. And he's still so dumb, he's not getting, she's really like setting me up to die. Because I don't know, maybe, maybe she has Philistines dropping by in armies with regularity. Verse 10, Delilah said to Samson, Behold, you've deceived me and you've told me lies. Now please tell me how you may be bound. Delilah plays this like, I am so offended that you lied to me. I mean, I realize you lived through the experience, but I am really offended. It would have been better if they'd have killed you, but I knew you told me the truth. I'm not sure how that plays out for being better for him. Okay. <coughs> she actually makes this about her. And you know what's weird? He gets that. He gets her total self-absorption. You know why? Because he's totally self-absorbed. And verse 11, he said, no, if they bind me tightly with new ropes that which have not been used, then I will become weak like any other man. So Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them. And you've got to be wondering, what does he think she's thinking? Like, this is not a person who's going to be a life partner that's going to really help you, okay? And it says, verse 12, for the men were lying in wait in the inner room, but he snapped the ropes from his arms like a thread. Then Delilah said to Samson, up to now you have deceived me and told me lies. No, up till now, lady, you've deceived me and put people that were trying to kill me in the inner room. Can we not understand who's doing wrong here? He said to her, if you weave seven locks of my hair with the web, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is this true if you weave seven locks of my hair? No. But what did he now get close to? He's now actually dealing with the actual symbol of his power. And now he's playing with that. He's just getting closer and closer to the truth. And still he's playing. If you weave seven locks of my hair with a web and fasten it with a pin, then I will become weak like any other man. This is the first time he breaks into what actually is the symbol of his power. By the way, what is his power from? It's not from his hair. What's it from? Hmm? God. It's from God. And why does the hair matter? The Nazarite vow. The Nazarite vow. But why... Why, when you cut the hair, does that suddenly take his power away? Yeah, you, when you end the vow, God ends the ability to come upon you and empower what you're doing because you've said you're done. So he lets you be done. I don't know a way to say this without being really hard, so I'm going to try and just soften it by saying that first, okay? Be careful what you ask God for. Be careful what you say to him. You cut the hair and you say the vow's over, then don't call on him to make the vow extended. 
You blow up your marriage, don't tell God that vows are important to you. You be careful what you say. Be careful all the vows you make and all the vows you break. And one of the things Jesus just said is just say yes and say no. Don't add a lot of other stuff to it because all you're doing is making it harder on yourself. Here's the problem. Now he's called into his actual locks of hair. So while he slept, Delilah took the seven locks of his hair and wove them into a web. She fastened it with a pin and said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. He awoke from his sleep and pulled out the pin and the loom and the web. Then she said to him, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You've deceived me these three times. As if any of those three times she had the intention of doing anything but binding him and getting him thrown in jail at the least, if not tortured and killed. Where has she shown love in all this? No place. But what's interesting is she makes it his fault. She makes it his fault. And it came about when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him that his soul was annoyed to death. <coughs> this is a phrase. She, he's so annoyed, it's better to die than go through this. So he told her that all that was in his heart and said, a razor has never come on my head. I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaved, then my strength will leave me and I will become weak and be like other men. If he was so worn out with her, what was his other choice? Just leave, since he didn't belong there to begin with. But what happens is we drive a stake of disobedience in the ground, and then we won't pull it out. Instead, what we do is we allow it to define our life. And what's interesting is what happens next. You know the story quite well. Our vows have to be shielded and they have to be upheld. And by the time we realize that we have made a deal with the devil, we're liable to be blind. So in the end, what he does is she made him sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his hair. I, I tell you what, this guy is comatose when he sleeps. Somebody's going, and he's, you know. But and nevertheless, in the middle of this, she then says, the Philistines are upon you. And he woke from his sleep. I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. The Lord left because he asked him to. That's what happened here. He dismissed God from the vow and God took seriously what he did. Then the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze chains and he was a <coughs> grinder in the prison. Just remember that sin blinds you and sin binds you and he ends up blind and bound. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after it was shaved off. Don't take that as the hair is the strength. What is the hair? It's a symbol of a vow. And so slowly and carefully, something changes in Samson. He begins to see the value of the vow, so he won't allow the hair to be cut again. And he starts in darkness with his eyes blinded, bound to a stone. Now the lords of the Philistines assembled together to offer a sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. For they said, our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hands. When the people saw him, they praised their God. For they said, our God has given our enemy into our hands, even the destroyer of our country who has slain many of us. It, ha it so, so happened that when they were in high spirits, they, called, they said, call for Samson that he may amuse us. So they called for Samson from prison and he entertained them. And when they made him stand between the pillars, Samson said to the boy who was holding his hand, let me feel the pillars on which the house rests, that I may lean against them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there. About 3,000 men and women were on the roof looking on it. 
while Samson was amusing them. And Samson called to the Lord and said, O Lord God, please remember me and please strengthen me just this time. Underline just this time. This is the second time he prays and this time there's no arrogance. He may be blind, but he's finally humble. And he says that I may at once be avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. It's interesting. He calls on God and asks him to do it, but he does it for a selfish reason. He doesn't do it because they broke, he broke the vow. He doesn't come to him saying, Lord, I have done horrible things. He comes and he says, you know what, God, these people have taken out my eyes and I want vengeance. And God uses this awful, self-consumed, blinded man. Samson grasped the two pillars on which the house was rested and braced himself against them, the one in his right hand, the other in his left. And Samson said, let me die with these Philistines. At the end of it, no one this side of the grave is beyond change. When they cry out to God in the midst of all their pain and deserved judgment, he can still use them. But the last words of Samson are a prayer, and God answers the prayer. It says, and he bent with all his might so that the house fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than those he killed in his life. Then his brothers and all his father's household came down and took him, brought him up, buried him between Zorah and Eshtaol in the tomb of Manoah his father. Thus he had judged Israel 20 years. This, there's really not a good way to end <coughs> Sorry, and the story, but here's the way the story ends. Family pain. This man had been a, uh, a pain in his family for his entire life. He had left death and destruction all the way through his family. We know at some point his father died during the time that he had been broken. Imagine Manoah for a minute. As we close today, think about this. Manoah was given an incredible promise by God. I'm going to give you a child. How many of you think that at least at some point, Manoah and his wife may not have thought they were better off before they had the baby? Their pain was so deep and his arrogance was so big that I'm wondering if at some point before Manoah died, he didn't say, man, I wished we hadn't asked and begged God to have a child. How many of you think Manoah and his wife felt like they were the ones who created the monster? But the truth is, they had a piece in it, but Samson is responsible for what Samson became. I want, I want you to be very careful not to blame the parents for the children. And I also want you to be very careful about something. Some of you are going to have wonderful, godly kids. It wasn't because you were so wonderful. Don't take the blame, but don't take all the credit either. I close this story the way the story closed. His family was in pain because his choices were bad. It does appear to me in the narrative that his parents were too permissive. It does. But at the end of the day, you become what you become, and you choose to become what you become.